church. You know, I got up this morning, I was hungry. And I hope that you've come hungry this morning for some spiritual food. Now, when I get hungry, one of the things that I crave is one of those double-doubles at the in and out Animal style. Animal style. You're with me right here. Well, you know, a lot of people are a little bit afraid of their Bibles and everything, particularly the Old Testament. I, I want us to go after it this morning, animal style. I want, I want us to, to get our fill of the Word of God, and it's going to be mm-mm good. Amen, church? The title, the title of our lesson this morning comes from Judges chapter 4 and 5. A song for the ages. And of course, we're going to be focusing on Deborah and Deborah's song. We've been studying the book of Judges now. And we've gone through chapters 1, 2, and 3. And of course, the book of Judges begins where the book of Joshua ends. At the death of Joshua himself. After the allotment to each of the tribes in the promised land. It was a dark time. We remember last week in Judges 17, verse 6, 18, 1, 19, 1, and Judges 21, 25, that the Bible said, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did as he saw fit. That's how it was in those days. Sadly, it's how it is in these days. The writer uses double and gender right there. No king in Israel? Obviously, there was no king. There wasn't a king until... King Saul. What it meant, though, is that God was not king in Israel. And everyone did as he saw fit. By this time, as we'll be reading in chapters 4 and 5, the tribes have become quite isolated from each other. The worship at Shiloh has seemingly been abandoned. And some of the darkest times have now been set upon what we call Israel. Remember last week, we talked about the first judge of Israel, Orthanel, and then the second one, Ehud, the left-handed guy. (laughs) And after Ehud, we read this in verse 31 of chapter 3. Then after Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. He, too, saved Israel. By this time, you should have had passed out a handout of where each of the tribes had their allotment in the promised land. Most likely, Shamgar was from the tribe of Judah because the Philistines were on the southern side of where Judah is at, right where we cut off the map here of the promised land. And then the Bible says, After Ehud died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Remember last week we talked about the pattern of the book of Judges, which in fact is a pattern throughout all of the scriptures. That when the people of God go into disobedience, then comes the darkness. The darkness brings a sense of distress. And we understood last week that when we're distressed, It's because God is against us. And in that distress, people cry out to God, the divine, the divine comes to save them how? Through a deliverer. And we found out last week that the word deliverer in Hebrew literally means savior. And so that pattern is there. Disobedience brings the darkness, which brings distress, which calls upon the divine who brings the deliverer. And so again, we find that pattern. And so in each case, when the Deliverer had saved Israel, the people turned to God. And it was awesome. But when the Deliverer died, the Bible says, then they turned back to the Baals and the Asterisks and prostituted themselves to these gods. And so once again, history repeats itself. And we read again verse 1. After Ehud died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, a king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. 
the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Hagaseth Hagoyim, because he had 900 iron chariots and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. The Israelites cried to the Lord for help. Well, here's the pattern again. Amen? Now, on your map, right above the Sea of Galilee is where Hazor is at. Okay? And the place that his general Cicero was from was literally just right above the Sea of Galilee right there. Heroseth Hagoyim. Goyim means Gentile in Hebrew. And, of course, some of the scriptures start to come alive right here. We see in that area, of course, is the tribe of Naphtali. And, of course, right next to that is the Zebulun right there. And, of course, that reminds us of Isaiah chapter 9. When the prophet says, land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, Gentiles of Galilee, a great light has dawned. And, of course, that's where it settles. Now, very interestingly, the Gentile occupation of this land was always there. The, the Israelites never drove them out. Not even in this day. And so, this is where we find that the king of Canaan, Jabin, had set up his kingdom. And so we read this. There was oppression for 20 years. The Israelites cry out to God. And then in verse 4, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidus, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you ten thousand men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops, to the Kishon River, and give him in to your hands. And Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. What a wuss. <laughs> Verse 9. Very well, Deborah said. I will go with you. But because of the way you're going about this, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah went to Barak to Kadesh, where he summoned the Zebulun and the Naphtali. Ten thousand men followed him, and Deborah also went with him. Now, on the map right here, to break things on down, you see Ephraim right here in the middle of the promised land. Of course, that became the power center for the whole promised land because Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim. And that's where Shiloh was set on up. Well, now the worship of Silo has seemingly dissipated. But Deborah is still there in Ephraim. And people come to her as a prophetess to be able to understand the will of God. And in that sense, she led Israel. But as we talked about, and as we'll see a little bit later, Israel is used very loosely. Sometimes it includes all 12 tribes, sometimes only a few tribes, sometimes only one tribe. But right here, it says that she led Israel from Ephraim. Well, then the Bible says right here that the Lord spoke to her, and she sent for Barak, who was from Naphtali in Kadesh. Or Kadesh. Now, Kadesh is not a city, it's a place. It's exactly in the same area, right above the Sea of Galilee, that Hazor is at. So, Barak's right there, and of course he's the natural commander to go against the Canaanites. The Bible says that she was told by God for to gather around Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor is right at the intersection of Zebulun, Naphtali, and Issachar right there. Right where the three tribes intersect, that's Mount Tabor. It's about 12 miles from the Sea of Galilee. And the plan was, is to go down from Mount Tabor, it's about 200 feet, 2,000 feet high, to rush down the mountain into the Valley of Jezreel and then to fight the enemy by the Kishon River. Now the Kishon River is that little river that's the border between Asher and Zebulun and Manasseh. Goes on out into the Mediterranean right there. And of course it was famous later on because that's where Elijah, you know, went against the 450 prophets of Baal there at Mount Carmel. Well, right here we find something, I think, very, very interesting. We have a plan that God gives to Deborah. She tells Barak, say, this is the plan. He says, well, I won't go unless you go with me. I mean, that is how sad it was at that time. There was no man willing to stand up and say, I will leave Israel. How like it is in so many churches today, it's the women who are devoted to God and the men are not present. 
That just shows the weakness of the time. That's kind of interesting to me. This next verse. Now Heber the Kenite had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zananim near Kadesh. So he's up in that area and you say, well, what are the Kenites? Who are the Kenites? And if I told you right here, as it says, that the descendants of Hobab, you go, well, who's Hobab? Well, let's go back. Let's go back to Numbers chapter 10. Keep your finger right there. Remember, we're not trying to daintily eat a little salad this morning. We're going double, double animal style. So grab your Bible. Grab your Bible. Numbers chapter 10. This is why Moses was leading Israel through the desert. And we read in verse 29. Now Moses said to Hobab, son of Ruel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law. Ah, Hobab is Moses' brother-in-law, the son of Ruel, or Jethro is another name for him. We are setting out of the place about which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we'll treat you. For the Lord has promised good things to Israel. He answered, no, I'll not go with you. I'm going back to my own land and my own people. But Moses said, please don't leave us. You know where we should camp in the desert and you can be our eyes. If you come with us, we will share with you whatever good things the Lord gives us. So they set out from the mountain of the Lord and travel for three days. These are the Kenites. They come from the Midianites. They're a little segment of the Midianites. Now, how big was this decision by Hobab to go with the people of God. It was gigantic. In Numbers chapter 31, we read this. Verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Take vengeance on the Midianites for the Israelites. After that, you will be gathered to your people. He says to Moses, There's one last thing you'll do before you die. Take vengeance, my vengeance, upon the Midianites. What do the Midianites do? Well, you remember the story in Numbers chapter 25. They are the people that entice the Israelites into immorality and idolatry. That decision by Hobab to join the people of God made an eternal difference. He saw something different in Moses. He saw something different in the people of God. And he was persuaded, not only to join them, but that he could help them. And Moses said, you will be our eyes going through the deserts. And so he saves his lineage. Now, the next place we read about the Kenites is in Judges chapter 1. In verse 16. The descendants of Moses' father-in-law, the Kenite, went up from the city of Palms with the men of Judah to live among the people of the desert of Judah in the Negev near Arad. So, at the time of the division of the promised land, the Kenites live in the southern part of Judah, way down at the bottom of our map. But by the time we read chapter 4, in verse 11, it says, Now Heber the Kenite had left the other Kenites. We understand that now. The descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent near the great tree in Zananim near Kadesh. Well, where's Kadesh? Well, it's right above the Sea of Galilee right there. So what had happened? Well, most likely, during the time of Shamgar, when the Philistines were pushing up from the south, he goes, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to get out as far north as possible away from the Philistines. And, of course, he gets away from the Philistines, and he's sitting amongst the Canaanites. That's kind of our lives. You know what I'm talking about? And so right here, the Bible just simply notes that. So let's read on. Verse 12. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera gathered together his 900 iron chariots and all the men with them from Hazaseth Hagoyim to the Kishon River. He says, okay, we are going against these Israelites that have banded together and we're going to meet them at the Kishon River. But you know, with Sisera was 900 iron chariots. Now to the Israelites, the iron chariots were the weapon they most feared because they had nothing to fight against them. Reading on. Verse 14. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go! This is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor, followed by 10,000 men. 
at Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all of his chariots and army by the sword, and Sisera abandoned his chariot and fled on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Heroseth had Goyim. All the troops of Sisera fell by the sword. Not a man was left. But what happened? I mean, it seems like the scriptures are silent. Well, if you go over to the song of Deborah, you find out what happens. Let's get a running start in verse 19 of chapter 5 of Judges. Kings came. They fought. The kings of Canaan fought at Taknik by the waters of Megiddo. But they carried off no silver, no plunder. From the heavens the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. The river Kishon swept them away. The age-old river, the river Kishon. March on, my soul. Be strong. Wow. Well, what had happened? A lot of tourists go to Israel and they go to the Kishon River and they're kind of disappointed because it's just kind of a, a small little brook. But during the rainy season, this little brook becomes 60 to 70 feet wide. And so the plan of God was you're to push Sisera and the iron chariots towards the Kishon River, which would have been expanding outward. And the Bible says that the river swept them away. And those who were swept away, you know how water, when it overflows the bank, it makes the banks muddy. Well, this is what must have happened to Sisera's chariot. It got stuck. He goes, man, i got to get out of here. That's why he goes on foot all the way back to where he's from, right above the northern part there of the Sea of Galilee right there. And so we continue on the story right here. Verse 17. Sisera, however, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. Because there were friendly relations between Jabin, king of Hazar, and the clan of Heber, the Kenite. Hmm. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right on in, don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she put a covering over him. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand at the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone here, say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. Now that's what you call a split and headache. <laughs> Verse 22. <laughs> Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, dead. On that day, God subdued Jabin, the Canaanite king, before the Israelites. And the hand of the Israelites grew stronger and stronger in Shaban, the Canaanite king, until they destroyed him. And the church said, Amen. Justice was prophesied. Barak was not honored, but a woman. Jael. Amen. Wow. What an incredible woman this lady Deborah was. Prophetess. Leading Israel. The Bible says that she was married to a guy named Lapidus. Also, the Bible says in verse 7, chapter 5, Billy's life in Israel ceased, ceased until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. She had kids. Don't ever think that because you're married with kids, you can't do something. Right here, she single-handedly saves Israel. Now, the last verse in chapter 5 says that there was peace for 40 years. And if we're to follow the pattern of the book of Judges, we would understand that it was at this time that Deborah died. And so, I don't think of Deborah as a particularly old woman. If she would have lived 40 years after this event, most likely she was a beautiful woman in her 30s with a husband and kids. And she cared deeply, passionately about her Israel. And the Bible says right here that she was fearless to preach the word. She called Barak to do what he did. And in the end, she inspired him. He does gather the troops up there on Mount Tabor. And the Bible says that he leads them down into the valley of Jezreel. Can you imagine that? 10,000 guys cranking down from the mountain? No wonder Sisera was pushed back to the Kishon River. And then, of course, it was the Lord. And I love what, what's put in her song right here when it says that, uh, verse 20, from the heavens the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. 
That is incredible. It's basically saying God's hand was with his people. And he was fighting for them. You know, can you imagine the sense of victory that day? The depth of darkness is really hard to imagine. Even this verse in verse 7, village life in Israel ceased. Ceased until I, Deborah, arose a mother in Israel. Well, why? Well, look at verse 6. In the days of Samgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the roads were abandoned. Travelers took to winding paths. It was dangerous to travel the roads in Israel because there was no central government. There was no authority. There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And Israel crumbled because of the lack of faithfulness to God, the king. But here, a great victory has been won. And with all great victories, so often in the Bible, there's a song that's written. And we know this, of course, as Deborah's song. It says in verse 1, On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang this song. Well, you know that Deborah wrote it because of the Hebrew verb. It says, in fact, it was a female that's doing the lead singing. Barak, I guess, sang back up. <laughs> In a very parallel occasion, we see that Moses wrote a song after his great victory of going through the Red Sea. Let's look at that. Chapter 15 of Exodus. All right, come on. Come on. The Bible says in verse 1, that Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he's highly exalted. The horse and its rider, he is hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Do you think he was fired up or not? Is there a song in your heart today? Look what happens with the, with the ladies. Verse 20 of chapter 15. Then Miriam the prophetess. Now, Miriam was the older sister of Moses. She's in her 80s right here, guys. Then Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her with the tambourine and dancing. Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he's highly exalted. The horse and its rider, he is hurled into the sea. He picks this 80-year-old woman out there with the tambourine just going at it. They're fired up. They're expressing it. It's natural. When God is victorious in your life, you're going to be fired up and there's going to be a song in your heart and your feet are going to dance. Are you with me right here? Our first point. (laughs) is praising God for the ages. Let's look at Deborah's song. I picture this woman, this younger woman getting up before all the troops of Israel, with the song that she had recently penned. And she starts singing with a sweet voice. When the princes of Israel take the lead, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. Hear this, you kings. Listen, you rulers, I will sing to the Lord. I will sing. I will make music to the Lord, the God of Israel. O Lord, when you went out from Seir, When you marched from the land of Edom, the earth shook, the heavens poured, the clouds poured down water, the mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai, before the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Samgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the roads were abandoned, travelers took to winding paths, village life in Israel ceased, ceased until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. When they chose new gods, war came in the city gates, and not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with Israel's princes, with the willing volunteers among the people. Praise the Lord. Right here, she lifts praise to God. And then she praises the willing hearts of those who took the lead and those who voluntarily, willingly followed. You know, the reason that we live in a time where families and churches are in disarray is that people are afraid to step up and take the lead. Leaders got to be unafraid of the people. The Word of God changes anyone, any place, any time. And the preacher is not bounded by walls. He should be a man that should be willing to march into any place, anywhere, anytime. 
A preacher should never say, no, I can't preach there. That would not be politically correct. Let me tell you something. I'll go preach anywhere. I'll preach in a Catholic church. I'll preach in a Mormon church. I may not worship there, but I will go and preach the Word. We as disciples have to have that heart to go anywhere to preach the Word of God. How beautiful it is when people work together willingly. I have to lift up one of our brothers, Mike Underhill. Come on, Mike. You know, three months ago, he was fallen away from God. And then the Holy Spirit worked in his life. Brothers got in there with the word, and he was restored. Not only is he restored, but now he's become our teen minister. And what's really awesome about this young man, what's really awesome about this young man, is he has such a heart for people now. He saw this one sister that he'd known many, many years ago, a sister in Christ. And he asked how it was going, and, and she was very sad. She said, well, it's been very hard. Uh, I just lost my dad about eight months ago. And so Mike visited the home and tried to encourage uh, this sister as, as well as the mom. And the mom only spoke Spanish. And Mike looked around, and he saw, man, this, this place is in total disrepair. Some disciples need to come and do an extreme makeover. <laughs> and so Saturday, Mike organized about 15 to 20 disciples to come with willing volunteer hearts. Now, I hear one of the most zealous ones was Steve Bolin. And of course, I have to laugh a little bit at Mike Underhill. You know, Mike Underhill kind of comes across like everything's cool, calm, and collected. <laughs> Like, you know, anything goes. I heard yesterday he was saying to everybody, listen, you're not leaving until we get the job done. It's amazing what getting restored in Christ will do for you. Get some convictions in you. You know what I'm talking about right here? And it was awesome because not only were the, were the volunteers working there, but then another one started thinking, hey, they need something to eat. And so Luis Martinez says, man... I'm going to go out and buy them ten pizzas. But here's the other awesome thing. One of our brothers, Albert Wagers, works at California Pizza Kitchen. And he had just done this deal with DJ that whoever we got there with these little slips would save 20% or would give 20% of the proceeds California Pizza Kitchen gives to the church here to help pay for Jubilee scholarships. And so on that day... We have the volunteers that Mike organized. Luis brings the food. Albert's supplying money for the Jubilee. And God is praised. Are you with me right here? You see, so much can be done when people work together. Are you with me? But there's got to be a decision. You've got to make a decision. You know, I look over here. I see Wally Kukowski. Yeah. Wally and Ted, they go way back. They go back to the early days of Boston. And Wally is uh, very notorious, I mean, very well known yeah. in the Boston church because in the church he has an incredible wife named Lori. And she had this great heart for God. And she started coming to the church. And it was a radical church with radical dreams. And after time, she got baptized. And Wally just stepped up the persecution. And she had quite a drive to make to come to church. And finally it came to a head. He just came to her and says, listen, Lori, it's either me or the church. Without a pause, she goes, it's the church. <laughs> Wally was baptized a couple weeks later. <laughs> See, you got you to gotta understand, church. You got to keep your convictions. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. For willing hearts. Amen. Let's continue with the song in verse 12. Right, she sings, wake up, wake up, Deborah. So she's talking about the time that God was waking her up for a prophetic vision. Wake up, wake up, Deborah. Wake up, wake up, break out in song. Arise, O Barak. Take captives, your captives, O son of Abinam. 
Then the men who were left came down to the nobles. Only a remnant still wanted to serve the Lord. The men who were left. See, God works with leftovers. <laughs> guys, guys. All of us, all of us have flailed in our Christian lives. All of us have failed. We're leftovers. But that's the kind of folk the Lord works with. Then the men who were left came down to the nobles, the people of the Lord, came to me with the mighty. Some came from Ephraim, whose roots were in Malik. Some came from Ephraim, not all of them. Benjamin was with the people who followed you. From Machir, captains came down, or Manasseh. From Zebulun, those who bear a commander's staff. The prince of Issachar was there with Deborah. Yes, Issachar was with Barak, rushing after him into the valley. In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Why did you stay among the campfires to hear the whistling for the flocks? In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of the heart. Wow. Have you ever heard of what's called the paralysis of analysis? That's what happened to Reuben. They just were thinking. Well, should we go down and fight or should we not? Should we go or should we not? Should I get baptized or should I not? Should I get restored? Should I place membership? And you don't do anything. And they never showed up for battle. Verse 17. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. Oh, Jordan's too wide. Can't go. That's my excuse. Remember, they were on the Trans-Jordan tribe. And Dan, why did he linger by the ships? Well, if you see on your map, Dan borders the Mediterranean Sea. They lingered by the ships because that's what brought in their wealth and their gain. Wow. Asher remained on the coast and stayed in his coves, for it was safe and comfortable. The people of Zebulun risked their very lives. So did Naphtali on the heights of the field. Kings came. They fought. The kings of Canaan fought at Terek by the walls of Megiddo. But they carried off no silver, no plunder. From the heavens the stars fought. From the courses they fought against Sisera. The river Kishon swept them away. The angel river, the river Kishon. March on, my soul, be strong. Then thundered the horses' hooves. Galloping, galloping go his mighty steeds. Curse Miros said the angel of the Lord. Curse its people bitterly because they did not come to help the Lord to help the Lord against the mighty. God is ticked off when we don't get involved in His battles. What happened right here? Well, Miros is a city in Manasseh. Manasseh had the strongest army and they didn't go down to fight. They weren't in the battle. But what's the issue? Gain, safety, comfort, obstacles. You see, our second point is dancing with the remnant. I, 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 I like to think that Deborah came on out and not only sang before the troops, but, but, but Bayrak in the background. <laughs> but you know it's hard to sing a victory song without doing a little swaying you know what I mean I mean even Miriam even Miriam 80 years old she's out there dancing and when you're happy you just can't stay still there's a song in your heart and your feet just want to move <laughs> See, there was something about being on Mount Tabor. Knowing that Deborah had pronounced the victory of God. Barak now inspired says, guys, let's go. Yes, it was against iron chariots. Seeming unstoppable. But God was with them. And Barak charges down that hill. First and 10,000 guys behind. I don't care if you were in... 900 iron chariots. You see those guys so fired up coming down? Scare the pejesus out of you. <laughs> they pushed them back. 
to Kishon River, their chariots got swept away and stuck. And victory from the stars, from God, came. It was God's victory. It was God's victory. Dancing with the remnant. Only a remnant showed up. Why? Well, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You know, when it comes right on down to it, all these people who didn't show up were just concerned about themselves. Their gain, their comfort, their safety. You see, they were self-absorbed, self-accusing, self-complacent, self-deceived, self-dependent, self-doubting, self-hatred, self-obsessed, self-pleasing, self-protective, and bottom line, self-worshipping. But Jesus said, if any man would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. That's what heroes do. Heroes are people who care more about others than their lives. That's why soldiers are heroes. They're laying their life on the line for us. Have you ever thought about it? Jesus calls us to be heroes. To care more about God's honor and other people than ourselves. Wouldn't it be awesome to understand that? That the whole church would be a church of heroes. Everybody. I'm for the Lord. And I'm out for other people. Then things like traveling an hour, or maybe two, are not about your discomfort, but others' salvation. And yes, giving a tithe again, that means less money for you. But it means more souls saved. And yes, it means you got to get out of bed on Sunday morning. But I don't know about you. I love to worship God in a church full of heroes. Because a little bit of that hero stuff rubs off. You know what I'm talking about? You hang around heroes long enough, you're going to become one of them. It's just what happens. You go, man, I I like all these heroes. I'd like to be one of them. That's what heroes do. They make other heroes. Jesus wanted us to have the heart to go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything. That's why I love Samira and Lloydie so much. This, This young couple had the guts to say, listen, I'm coming back to God. I tanked it. I flailed. I failed. But my God will take me back. And it's time for me to step up and be a hero. I, I, Lordy's restoration was so powerful. I hope, I hope you caught it. When she fell away, she looked at all these hurting people. And she wanted to say something, but she's fallen away. She knew what the answer was. She knew what the answer was. You know, this week I was, I was listening to the radio. And I, and I, was, I was thinking about this lesson and, and, and Deborah and, and, and in a sense really trying to honor women with this message. Because the world trashes them so much. And there came a song on that uh, I remembered back in the early 80s. And it, it, just, it just hit me. And as I listened to the words, I, I started crying. Have you ever just heard an old song and you just start, start crying? Not because you're getting old. But, but this, uh, this song was by, her, her, her name was Charlene, and, and the, the title song was, I've Never Been to Me. And it climbed the top of the billboards. And the words were, hey lady, you lady, cursing at your life. You're a discontented mother and a regimented wife. 
I have no doubt you dream about the things you'll never do. But I wish someone had talked to me like I want to talk to you. Oh, I've been to Georgia and California and anywhere I could run. I took the hand of a preacher man and we made love in the sun. But I ran out of places and friendly faces because I had to be free. I've been to paradise, but never been to me. Please, lady, please, lady, don't just walk away. Because I have this need to tell you why I'm all alone today. I can see so much of me still living in your eyes. Won't you share a part of a weary heart that has lived a million lies? Well, I've been to Nice and the Isle of Greece. Well, I've sipped champagne on a yacht. I've moved like Harlow and Monte Carlo and showed him what I've got. I've been undressed by kings and I've seen some things that women ain't supposed to see. I've been to paradise, but I've never been to me. Hey, you know what paradise is? It's a lie. A fantasy we create about people and the places we'd like them to be. But you know what the truth is? It's a little baby you're holding. It's that man that you fought with this morning. The same one you're going to make love with tonight. That's the truth. That's love. You know, I, when, I, when I heard I just started crying. I just thought about, in particular, all the women. They're just all beaten up by the world. Used by guys. For their own sinful purposes. Sometimes even in marriage. There's so much disrespect. I mean, it's just it's just horrible to me that men would strike their wives. You know, it's kind of interesting. She goes on, she says, Sometimes I've been to crying for unborn children that might have made me complete. But it took the sweet life. I never knew I'd be bitter from the sweet. I've spent my life exploring the subtle whoring that costs too much to be free. Hey, lady, I've been to paradise, but I've never been to me. See, a lot of people want the sweet life. But the sweet life, as she says, I'd be bitter from the sweet. You know, I think there are a lot of disciples that look in elsewhere besides Jesus for the sweet life. Their dreams, their fantasies, their lies. They're the devil's lies. We have in Christ everything we need for life and godliness. And God forbid any of us would go through the hell that Lordy had to. Knowing the truth, but not having a life to be able to help women out. You know, it's been a long time since I just cried for lost people. It felt good. It felt good. Because sometimes you got to cry to dance with the remnant. You know, I'm so fired up about what's happened in Phoenix with our sister church there. Got a call from Matt. You know, just a year ago, almost to the day, uh, we sent out the 14... Uh, disciples on the mission team and the remnant group joined them down down there and uh, that was the day CL was baptized uh, there in the Rose Garden and uh, it's, it's been amazing because now that that little group has multiplied to over 50 disciples and in the last five weeks they've had six people baptized into Christ is that awesome why because these people are denying self They had that spirit, go anywhere, do anything, give up everything. Is that your heart? Are you willing to dance with the remnant? Let's go to our last point. Come on, Kevin. We're going to go to the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah. Our first point was praising God for willing hearts. Our second was dancing with the willing remnant. And our third one is listening to our willing God sing. You know, uh, it's so awesome when you think about all the songs that were written during the glory times in our movement. You know, we sang one day, Hallelujah! Go make disciples! Great among the nations! Prayer for boldness! Be with me, Lord! I need your love. Of course, one of my favorites when the Lord was moving here is that uh, Louise put words 
to the glory song. And people, because it was such a great victory, told the history of the L.A. church. And then, of course, I, I loved uh, DJ's song, the Portland song. And that one line, where are the people that still dream? And he said, welcome to Portland, Oregon, where the rains are pouring. Hope your soul feels at home. All the people criticizing, but we're just baptizing. Got plenty of H2O. <laughs> That's Portland, Oregon right there. <laughs> and Zephaniah, Zephaniah talks about the remnant of those people. He talks about God. Verse 13. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong. They will speak no lies, nor will deceit be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. That is who we need to be. Sing, O daughter of Zion! Shout aloud, O Israel! Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will any harm befall you. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limb. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. That's where the song comes from. I hear God singing. Do you hear God singing this morning? I do. I hear God singing. I see a group of people that God takes great delight in. I think especially the ones that were restored today. And then Tinka, who's going to be baptized today. There's a sense of peace. One of the sisters I've come to respect so much is Lucy Mejia. And it's been really cool because uh, Carlos and I have been getting together and Lena, Lucy have been getting together and DJ and Casey have been in there and others, but it's great. I mean, it's, you know, when, when it's just, you know, sometimes we're closest brothers, but sometimes there's just a, a, a sense of a soul connecting the soul. Yeah. And we all get together just to talk about placing membership. For those that are visiting, we're very hard line, according to the Bible, about anybody that's baptized, restored, or placed membership. They got to be willing to go anywhere, do anything, give up everything. Got to be a sold out disciple. And it was, it was, it was awesome because Carlos felt he needed to go ahead and make his decision place membership a couple weeks ago. And Lucy was honorable in saying, you know, I'm not quite ready yet. And we started talking about it. We got together on Thursday. And I was just talking. I, just, you know, I was just kind of trying to wrap things on up. And I said, you know, it's going to be great. You know, we're all going to be best friends. And I was just going into it. You know how you're trying to wrap up the conversation. We're all going to be best friends. And Lucy starts crying. I go, sis, what's wrong? She goes, I'm just so moved. I'm just so moved by God. You know, that sense of purity, righteousness, and that quiet love that we felt coming out of the waters of baptism can be anyone's that returns to God. And at that moment, I saw that quiet love fall upon our sister Lucy. You see, he's going to rejoice over us with singing. Two signs of the coming kingdom were given, one in the old and one in the new. In Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, it says that fathers will be united with their sons, and sons will be united with their fathers. I look around the room here, and I think about the McGee's, and when they got restored, and then their son Jared was baptized. I think about the Anakeas. They got restored. And their son Durian got baptized. You see, fathers are being united with their sons. And sons united with the father. That's a sign of the kingdom. That's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the sign of the kingdom was in Acts 2.17. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. You see... The kingdom is all about dreams. It begins with broken dreams. You can't enter the kingdom with your own dream. You have to be willing to give all your dreams to God. 
But our God's a gracious God. And he gives back dreams that just far surpass any dreams that we had before. And one of the things that I see so awesome about the Lord doing is bringing back people that have done heroic deeds for the Lord. Often in full-time ministry. And God bringing them back by either the Spirit having in place membership or them being restored. You know, a dear, dear brother of mine is, is uh, here. And uh, I love always getting with Marty Wooten. And uh, today happens to be his birthday. 56. 56. Woo! And you know something, when I, 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 was, I was moved to this first article where he talked about, he says, now that I've placed membership at the City of Angels Church, I sense that my dreams are being rekindled. And my talents once more can be used to serve the Lord. That's just incredible. I think about the Velasco's. I mean, the, 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 they, they just have stepped, they've gone through the worst financial challenges in the last several months. I mean, to be praying for Sal to get that job. But just some in all of that, they're still trying to serve other people and give and open up their house. I think about the Mejias. I just talked about them. I mean, this is an incredible couple. It's so awesome because right after Lucy said, "Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna place membership," Carlos goes, "Okay." I cannot wait for my Bible talk to start. I said, well, let's, let's pull Lucy on in right there, you know. And he goes, I'm inviting this person and that person and this person and that person and this person. I'm going, amen, bro. I talked about Mike Underhill. He was in a full-time ministry. He was, he was leading USC. The Onikeas, they were, they were leading the AMS over in Honolulu. The Bolins, they were leading the high desert sector. Just to see them scrap and fight. Just to stay faithful. I talked about Albert and his works there at uh, California Peach Kitchen. Albert used to run the Upside Down Club. I think about the Zindlers moving here. You know, he wrote, he wrote the bulletin this week. Talked about being in the ministry in Boston, being in the ministry in Orlando. And then, of course, the Martinez's. Kathy used to live with us for a while. And she's really like a daughter. And just to see them get stronger and stronger in the Lord has been incredible and inspiring. Amen? Amen. And because they, they've just served so many people. At one time, they were in the full-time ministry. And they were made evangelist and women's ministry leader. And so, seeing their lives, Elena and I, and talking to some of the other leaders in the congregation, we have decided that two weeks from today, they will be reappointed evangelist and woman's ministry leader in the church here. Now, they're going to be making tents. They're not going to be paid anything, but that go, he's going to be an evangelist and she's going to be a woman's ministry leader. You see, the Lord, when you come back to God, God is going to put dreams on you. Yes, the young men are going to have visions. A Mike Underhill, a DJ, a Victor, they got a lot of vision and they need to. But the old guys... The old guys, we're going to dream dreams. Are you with me right here? At the time of Deborah, the song lasted for 40 years. And then her voice was silent. Let us pray that God's voice is never silenced in our lives. And we always hear God singing in our day. Thanks and God bless.